instead of referring to other texts, because as you know, in our culture, films are texts, right? And very important ones. A lot more people, a lot bigger impact on the objective culture. Let's face it. Take a movie like Heather's, beautiful expression of the will to nothingness played out almost like an active will. In the movie Heather's, the young rebel wants the whole high school to commit suicide together and sign a mutual note about it and, call, and it'll be the Woodstock of the 90s. I like that. That's cute. That's in the spirit of Joy Division's famous line in one of their albums referring to Nietzsche. There's no turning back the last man. In other words, the last humans are already here. There's no turning back the next step. So today, for example, and now I will, in sympathy with some of my friends I know who teach in theology, I should say, that their problem today, formulated in a, in a very high, at a high level, would be uh, not the disbeliever, which was the older problem you discussed in, in theology departments, not the non-believer, their problem today is the non-person. In other words, to find someone for whom belief or disbelief might mean any damn thing either way. It's not that you can't find people that won't go, oh, I believe, I believe, because you will. But to find someone that believes, you know, believes, like Kierkegaard believed or St. Paul believed, you know, really believes. So their problem isn't some, finding some silly, tricky little argument, but finding some human being somewhere to make it to. This is the nihilism that makes Nietzsche relevant to the current situation. What Nietzsche actually sees as the, as the end of this is that what, center, what it centered around was God, and yet modern conditions, which I've characterized as the advent of capitalism, mass communication, what Max Weber said were called what, the disenchantment of the world. Sure. Disenchantment. I don't want to make that sound too strong because the enchanted world of the Middle Ages, you know, if you got a toothache in that enchanted world, it was unpleasant. So there are good things about modernity that I appreciate, like penicillin and other things. But, so don't get too carried away with this enchanted, disenchanted distinction of Max Weber's. Nevertheless, though, Max Weber called this modern world disenchanted, and Nietzsche's trope for that, and this is the name of this lesson is called what, what a thing to call a lesson, the death of God. You know, I mean, this is one of Nietzsche's most notorious, as you know, parables. And uh, I'm going to use it and hope that I get a chance to interpret it to uh, bring to an end this sort of Nietzsche as a moralist, as a moralist uh, point. Uh, in any case, I want to, I want to, before I do that, I want to make two quick points about what I've just said. Both the Greek ideal, and, and don't think these are very limited ideals, they structure all the things we, we still value, to the extent that we're still human and still value things. Uh, the Greek ideal, and then the Christian ideal, from which our, our uh, other theories grew, say crucially important for all other theories, uh, as we, by the, I mean for all other ethical theories. Uh, for, one other way Nietzsche sees these, and then I'll get on to this passage, is this way. Nietzsche talks about a reversal of values. That's from the master to the slave. Now, or from the active to the reactive human. That's the reversal. And the reversal, as I say, it has a double edge to it. It makes humans more mendacious, more interesting, sexier, more sinful, interesting. One more example might help there. I mean, I, I, want, to, I want to make this point clear. Uh, Augustine's Confessions, I don't know how many of you have read this, but Augustine's Confessions are magnificent, and I think it's a wonderful book. Uh, Augustine feels more guilt and has more excitement over stealing a pear than any of us would feel if we stole seven million dollars. I mean, Augustine in the Confessions evokes sin in the most marvelously embodied way because he stole a stinking pear. We're a long way from that historically, folks. That is far distant. And now, my scary thing I'd like to say is I'm about to read this parable about the death of God. It's supposed to be shocking, 
and yet I feel like I'm at a time and a place in culture when we're far distant from our ability to be shocked by that at all either. What Nietzsche took to be most shocking, I think today is just grist for a certain commodity, system, certain way of advertising. And today, world spirit may very well be just advertising. But nevertheless, let me uh, give you the famous parable, Nietzsche's Death of God parable, and, uh, and I'll use it to bring this kind of suspicion to an end because with the death of God we have uh, in Nietzsche, and, and I, I, it's going to take a long time to explain it. I'll do that in the next lecture. We'll talk more about this parable. We could have spent eight hours interpreting just the parable. First of all, the, a parable called the death of God can't be atheism, right? Because to, to, the, to the bourgeois atheist, it makes no sense to say God died because there wasn't one, so he couldn't have died. So that doesn't make sense. The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life and about Nietzsche's both fear and exhilaration at what might come next. And we still, to a large extent, live in the interregnum between, between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that, lived in periods like that. So Nietzsche, in that sense, is also a prophetic thinker. So I'll share with you, you know, just so you can scandalize your friends, hell if nothing else, Nietzsche's famous uh, parable, and uh, it's from the gay science. Uh, the one I want to share with you is the parable from the gay science called the madman, naturally. And as a madman myself, sometimes a professional madman, I enjoy this passage a lot, the gay science, uh, this is uh, 125, Aphroism 125. And of course, these are the, the, some of Nietzsche's fragments he's best known for because they're filled with hyperbole and wonderful invective. And, and uh, so this one, I, I enjoy this one. The Madman. Have you not heard of that madman who lit a lantern in the bright morning hours and ran to the marketplace? Please follow Nietzsche's every line because none of this is accidental. The madman lit a lantern and ran to the marketplace okay, and cried incessantly, I seek God, I seek God. Well, you can imagine that in a mall, right? The cops are going to come and pull you out because nothing in a mall is that serious. It's not designed to be, folks. Anyway, as many of those who do not believe in God were standing around just... See, you all thought Nietzsche was not, was just a simple atheist. But now, now follow this. Uh, as many of those who did not believe in God were standing around just then, he provoked much laughter. Maul again, right? Oh, God, get the sky pilot out of here. Uh, did he get lost, one said? Did he lose his way like a child, said another? Or is he hiding? Now they're talking about him. Or is he hiding? Is he afraid of us? Has he gone on a voyage? Has he immigrated? They yelled and laughed. The madman jumped into their midst and pierced them with his glance. Whether is God, he cried, I shall tell you. We have killed him. You and I. All of us are his murderers. But how have we done this thing? How were we able to drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What did we do when we unchained the earth from its center, from its sun? Whether is it moving now? Away from all suns? Or are we not plunging continually, backward, forward, sliding in all directions? Do we not hear anything yet of the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? even so close to them, I'm, I'm adding the text now, even as close to some of those grave diggers as we all sit today? Don't we hear them, they're digging at all? Is not night and more night coming on all the time? Do we not smell anything yet of God's decomposition? God's too decomposed. God is dead. God remains dead. 
and we have killed him. Now there's a change. Okay, now, the mall people are a little quiet now because this 